So let me invite uh, Jack at Twitter and Mr. Amitabh Khan uh, to the stage for a conversation. Jack, please welcome to this evening and please join me in welcoming Dr. Thank you. So I'm going to actually allow both of them to have a conversation, but I want to be sufficiently provocative in my initial comments so that they can respond to this. The first, of course, is Jack has been working very hard to create better conversations at Twitter, uh, using algorithms, using AI, uh, using certain new rules in, and ethics in management of the system. And of course, Mr. Khan has been, as you heard him speak a little while back, determined to use technology to change the way of governance. So we have someone who's working with AI and governance, and someone who's working uh, with AI for the betterment of the public sphere. Uh, both of them are struggling with questions of bias, questions of certain uh, outcomes which are intended and, and collateral developments. So, uh, with this introduction, I'm going to allow Mr. Khan to run this conversation. If I think they're getting too politically incorrect, I will jump in. But you have probably 15 to 20 minutes to have this conversation, and the end of it probably I'll pose the question. Mr. Khan, over to you. So, Jack, it's a great pleasure and delight to have you with us. Let me first uh, uh, take this opportunity to welcome you. Uh, this is your first trip to India. Uh, what took you so long? <laughs> so, that's a good question. I don't have a, I don't have a good answer to that. There's no excuse. Okay. Uh, so tell me, I mean, uh, where does India figure in the Twitter global strategy? I mean, we have a very young demographic. 70% uh, of the population is middle age, 30, average age, 29. Uh, how do you see India? Uh, where does India figure in your global strategy? Well, I mean, I, I think um, India is a perfect fit for what we aspire to be and, uh, and what we're trying to build. Uh, it's a very conversational, open, and transparent public culture. And that's exactly what we, we, uh, we intend to build. Thank you so much. Um, we intend to build with, uh, with Twitter. Um, so we, we do feel that there is a, an amazing uh, parallel uh, to both the country and the and the service, and uh, we're going to invest a lot into it. Yeah, so I was wondering, you know, we still, uh, uh, if you look at the number of users from India of Twitter, 7.8 million, seventh biggest, uh, I was only wondering because uh, uh, we in India, we, we have about uh, 450 million internet users, and we are aiming to have another 500 million internet users in the next five to six years, all on the basis of uh, our regional and Indian languages. Uh, what is your strategy for spreading Twitter through the Indic languages? In my mind, that's critical. It is critical, and uh, we're, we're a bit behind that. Um, so we, uh, you know, we're, we're focused on making sure that we have the platform to do that in the right way, and that we have the support. Um, I imagine it means opening up a little bit more in terms of our translation services. Um, but uh, we, we, we're definitely behind, but we're, we're aware of it. In our so, uh, you know, I find it quite amazing that uh, you, you're one of the most fascinating uh, entrepreneurs because you're a co-founder and a CEO of both Square and of uh, Twitter. And uh, most of us, you know, because Twitter is so hyped up, people haven't heard of Square. Uh, where you've done some amazing things at Square. We in India are really pushing the limits of digital payments. Uh, you know, we have this unified payment interface where all the banks are connected. Actually, I haven't used uh, anything but my mobile to do all my digital transactions for the last one year. Where do you see Square in India? Well, we, you know, we, payments is just part of our business. Uh, a big part of our business is around uh, lending as well enabling entrepreneurs um, to operate their business, enabling entrepreneurs to get money, access to funds to build their business. So uh, payments is the non-discretionary bit, but, um, and, and it's certainly a big part of what they do, but ultimately our goal is to help sellers make more sales. Uh, and that is our, our true business, is for the solutions that help them make more sales, whether it be a point of sale, to help them better make decisions, or uh, a loan. Lent out over, over three million dollars um, to small businesses in the United States with an average loan size, loan size of six thousand dollars. Uh, 
Um, so pretty meaningful numbers. Um, and uh, significant financial services to people who haven't had access to the past. So then you see a road for square, much bigger road for square in India. As India pushes the boundaries of financial inclusion, it pushes the boundaries of digital payments, it uses technology to leapfrog in some of these areas. We, we would love to. We would love to be here in India. The, the, the issue with, uh, with Square, unlike with Twitter, with Twitter we, we could write the um, service and the whole world could use it from day one. With Square, we write something and we have to go to each market and we have to have a relationship with the bank. And then we have to pay attention to the local regulatory. And then we have to pay attention to how folks are identified um, so that we can minimize the fraud. So it ends up being a six to even over a year process just to start within the, within the nation. So it takes a lot of our resources in order to do that, which means that we can't do other things as well. So um, we're a small company, and uh, we fund market by market by market, and India eventually will be it, but not, not, not just there yet. But your market cap is more than that of Twitter. Square's market cap is more than that of Twitter. So I was wondering, because we in, we in India have done a, almost want to work around uh, digital payments. You know, our whole philosophy has been that uh, we we really use technology in in the uh, in the payment reality and uh, push it. So I was wondering whether a product like Terminal could be more handy in India. Yeah, I I think Terminal would be amazing in India, but we would want to pay attention to what people actually need here, and like we've. You know, we've been building, we've been building Square for nine years, and it's taken us some time to get to something like Square Terminal or Solve One. We started with uh, requiring that people use their own personal devices to accept payments, and uh, it turns out that a number of people don't want to use their personal phone to accept it, accept payments. They want a dedicated device, so that's why we built the Square Terminal. Um, so we want to make sure that we're we're listening to people and we're building what fits the market. So tell me, how do you combine the role? I mean, you're the CEO of Twitter, you're the CEO of Square, you don't have a table, you don't have an office. How do you survive? I have a table, I just don't use it. <laughs> we have lots of tables. And how does your staff manage to work around you? Staff, how do you manage to work around you? <laughs> she disappeared. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's um, these two companies that care so deeply about and I want to do whatever it takes to make them work. And as long as I'm um, relevant to the two companies, then I'll stick around. Um, if I'm not, then you know we'll make we'll make different choices. But in order to make it work, I've had to make my life work around it as well. And I see them as as one job and a big. Reason why I can do that is because I have really amazing people around me who run the business, and I, I see my job in three parts. Number one, make sure that we do have an amazing team that works together. Number two, make sure we're making decisions in the context of who we're serving and paying attention to the secular trends like AI or blockchain or whatever else is coming up. And number three, to raise the bar on what we thought was possible. And as companies grow, just like as, as individuals grow, we start becoming precious about what we have. And we tend to take less risk and tend to protect ourselves a little bit less. So my job is to remind us that we don't have to hold sacred what we started with. Um, we, can, uh, we can think a lot bigger, and, and what we're doing today is not good enough. Um, so we need, to, we need to move faster in India, for instance, or we need to figure out how to open a market within three months instead of nine months. So. Uh, so tell me, you know, at the Wired Up Summit, you said in San Francisco that uh, uh, Twitter actually has been behind the curve as far as artificial intelligence is concerned. And uh, but you know, in 2017, in the first six months, you deleted close to about 300,000 uh, 300, uh, Twitter accounts of uh, terrorists, uh, uh, people with uh, shady pasts, etc. Uh, you've done it all through algorithms, no human touch to it. Well, I think the artificial intelligence is great when it's paired with, with humans. So we have algorithms that bubble up interestingness to humans. This is how Square operates as well. You know, Square had to start with AI. It's called data science back then. And the 
it evolved to machine learning and deep learning and, and the progress of artificial intelligence, but we, we build algorithms to bubble up interestingness to humans so they can be more effective in their judgments. Um, sometimes in, uh, an algorithm can take care of everything, but we want to make sure that we're, um, we're understanding why the algorithm makes a decision. And to me, that's the greatest danger and where we're headed with artificial intelligence is a lot of the algorithms we write today aren't able to explain why they made a decision. And uh, then it appears like a black box, and if we can't explain why we make decisions, we lose trust. Um, and it's really important given we're, um, we're, we're pushing all, so many decisions to algorithms. Can I actually comment on this? I think they make it easier a little more with this. Get in a highly polarized public sphere every day. Whether it's India, the US, your secular trend, uh, binaries and polarization. And both sides accuse Twitter of being unfair. Uh, I think you are welcome with a variety of tweets in India because some uh, Indian Twitter are teaching you that your algorithms were uh, functioning in ways detrimental to their influences. Uh, in this polarized environment, are algorithms better than making those different decisions? Uh, or do you think? It makes it even more important to have the human decision-making choice, or the human choice and engagement. Well, we have to keep in mind that humans write algorithms and humans could have bias. Um, so there is a field of research called fairness in algorithms you know, that tries to remove some of this bias and create more impartiality. But we always have to be mindful of it whenever we get to a perfect answer. We would love to use more algorithms just because it scales our humans better. So, you know, I, I, the reason I love startups is because you have these small teams doing really big things. And that's what technology enables, is like it enables a single individual to have a global impact. And that's an amazing concept, but also can be a dangerous concept as well. So um, I think that the only, you know, the, the, the guard we have against um, any, any sort of danger is really transparency. And uh, transparency earns, earns trust, what's the main accountability or stress. So as long as we're building explainability into our algorithms and we're building with an understood and uh, shared aligned set of guidelines for fairness, uh, then you know, I think we'll, we'll do the right thing. But it, it can easily go sideways. Uh, so you know, there's been this huge debate in India about uh, moderating the content. Uh, I'm a great believer in freedom of expression. What would be the appropriate balance between freedom of expression and moderating the content on social network? Well, it's really simple. Like when, when you use speech to silence someone, someone else, you don't have freedom of expression. Uh, but what about where uh, freedom of expression is being used to spread uh, racism or terrorism? What do you do in those cases? Well, so we, we have, um, you know, in, in certain cases like. Uh, Racist threats or other threats, it shuts someone down from even wanting to participate in the sentences or um, So we have to recognize that and uh, enforce it. And enforcement can come in many factors. Um, I, you know, I'm an optimist and I believe that, you know, we can at least try to um, show people ways of more tolerance. Um, that's what I would hope. But um, obviously, it's not always going to and in terms of terrorist content, then uh, you know we we pay attention to illegal activities and we remove any illegal content off our. Can I ask you something on, on precisely this point? But let's bring the gender question. And I think there have been two studies. One very interesting article this morning, but our own study that before Myanmar joined the dark side and she was still at the last URF, we did a study of of, the, of women on Twitter, and we did a massive uh, one week long analysis of previous handles. The participation on political questions is increasingly being diminished by the bullying and, and, and the kind of language and kind of expressiveness that's uh, out there on Twitter. Uh, is that a big uh, uh, issue for, for Twitter, making a more, yeah. more conversation? Yes, yeah, it's, it's not acceptable to say the word today. Um, so I think, you know, ultimately this abuse and harassment is leading people and women to silence themselves and, and not participate in I believe we all lose out. Our number one objective as a company is to increase the health of conversations, and public conversation is our medium. So um, we're, we're not going to 
ever get to a perfect solution, but we do intend to make major progress to help more people feel included and able to participate. Right, so one of, the, one of the things which fascinated me was that, uh, you know, the few research said that two-thirds of the people who get on to Twitter actually get on to it for purposes of news. And there is such a, uh, you know, clouding of boundary between uh, the real news and the fake news. Uh, how do we how do we distinguish uh, between the real world and the fake world, and uh, what can be done by social networks? Well, I think the most important thing is that we need to scope the problem down as tight as possible. So, you know, there's there's misinformation out there, but like you know, you have to pay attention to the context, and there's certain misinformation that might be harmless. But there's certain information that has intent to harm. And that intent to harm might intend to mislead people into a particular action. So uh, finding misleading information um, and determining whether it's misleading, I think, is absolutely critical. Uh, and it's a, you know, a, a tighter problem, a tighter scoping than just misinformation more broadly. So when is it the case that information or a tweet intends for someone to take a particular action? that they may not otherwise want to take. That is dangerous. And, and that is where we have a responsibility to minimize the spread and minimize the implications of the content. Um, is this how we look at health as well? So if, if you exhibit healthy conversation on our platform, um, we have a goal to amplify your tweets and your content to people who otherwise might not be following you and might find it relevant. If you don't exhibit healthy behavior, if you're toxic, if you're engaging in abuse or harassment that's targeted, we have no responsibility to amplify your content. Uh, it, it should go to your own audience, but we have no responsibility to amplify it broader. Uh, because we're, you know, when we amplify the content, we're actually placing it in front of people who weren't asking for it. They're not following you by default. So, it comes with a lot of responsibility. Uh, you know, you made a very important point because this is what we were discussing, that uh, the challenges of the emerging world, particularly India, are so distinct from the Western world. You know, the challenges of nutrition, the challenges of health, the challenges of enhancing production in the agriculture sector. And how do we use social media to really spread this message of improving productivity or improving infant mortality, maternal mortality, or where we, you know, in several of our backward areas, where we have caught up in this vicious cycle of malnutrition. I mean, how do we, how do we use the power of social media and the Indian languages of it to really spread this message and become very powerful? I, I don't think there's any other way to solve problems than to have conversations about them. We get to acknowledge the problem, we get to address it, we get to provide updates on the status, but like, no problem is solved unless we actually discuss it. So we want to make sure that we are the conversation medium for the world. And we're facing, you know, we, we, we definitely want to host a lot of conversations that are happening in India, but we think more important is to host this global conversation. We're facing things that no one country can actually solve. We're facing uh, climate change. There, there, India can make a ton of impact in minimizing climate change, but if the US doesn't get on board and China does not get on board, it'll be for now. Uh, Technology and AI and disruption in the workforce is something that not no one country can solve alone. All people of the world needs to address and needs to acknowledge it. So we we want to push as much as possible people into a global conversation because we think that's the only way the world learns and ultimately the only way that the, the world solves problems together. So then you went and met uh, you had a good meeting with Shahrukh Khan. <laughs> yeah, I walked down the street and knocked on the door and he happened to be there, so I walked in. Have you ever, ever seen a Hollywood movie? Yes. Would you like to act in one? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so have, you, have you met any of these actresses, as Indian act, Hollywood actresses? No, no, not yet. Okay, <laughs> okay wonderful. Uh, so we look forward, wonderful. Uh, let me, let me... Uh, You're kind of just letting that go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I was, I was uh, worried that... I can't be going to launch Amitabh Park production next year. So, <laughs> so, and he was going to make you his, his first actor, lead, lead actor. But let me ask you a question. I think you've touched on a very important point, making conversations global as we wrap up this uh, uh, particular conversation with you. Uh, I want to ask both of you, Mishan, what would be 
first communication. The first is that, uh, you know, let's go back to McLuhan. The media is the message. In many ways, while you were a platform, today Twitter itself is the message. And you are working hard to get that message to be uh, what the world needs at this stage. And as you do that, how conscious are you of the fact that uh, what you are producing out there now using the world tools and human interventions and regulations and rules is <coughs> making you an actor. You have moved beyond the state of being just a platform for getting people to have a conversation on to becoming an actor, active political, social, economic actor. How conscious are you that in your decision making? And I've seen your tweets late at night now beginning to begin a number of issues. So is that something that uh, that is changing in Twitter in its new avatar from the first time when you wanted your friend to be to advance it. I think that's why it started with Twitter in the first avatar. So how conscious are you about this new role of Twitter as a social global agent, economic agent, Twitter like Well, we, we feel fortunate and grateful that the world, uh, or, or parts of the world, choose Twitter to have a conversation. And we do feel a responsibility um, to make sure that we do our part to ensure that it's healthy to increase the health, and that's why it is the number one objective for the company. So we're not taking a neutral stance. Um, we, you know, we, we, we see a distinction between neutrality and impartiality. We should be um, impartial in our actions. We should, can, we should be unbiased. We should consider a variety of perspective. We should not favor one account over another. Um, but neutrality is, is way too passive to what we see on the the phone company should be neutral. A one-on-one -on -one conversation between the two of us should be completely neutral. Anything should be able to go over it because it's not affecting anyone else. The results of it might affect someone else. But Twitter is seen as a public square. It's seen as a place like this where people can come together and talk. And some, in some cases, people intend to disrupt the conversation of, of others and it takes away from the feeling of public square. And the beauty of the public square is you have concerned citizens who want the best of the public square. And when someone is um, being belligerent, they go up and tell them. And if they continue to do so, you know, there, there, there tends to be a bunch of folks who show them what's up and, and ask them to leave. And it's about the question for you. Twitter itself has been working with institutions like ours to, uh, to be able to use their data for, for studying I believe that Twitter is one of the most uh, uh, transformational innovations because uh, India has very, very unique problems of uh, you know, spreading out and spreading the message of transformation to people in vast rural areas. And I think it's, it's a very powerful tool for those in governance to spread the message of uh, extension, promotion, mass communication, all that. Uh, I think we need to use the Indic languages much more to spread it. And as India becomes a billion plus with smartphones, I mean, we have about 450 million smartphones, but in three years' time, we'll be about a billion plus smartphones. And the amount of data we are consuming is more than the data of the SHI together. So there'll be a huge amount of data. Uh, now, in India's case, unlike America, where Google and Facebook own the data, and in China, where Tencent and Alibaba own the data, we have, we've created UBI, we've created Aadhaar, we've created, we have a billion biometrics. So we have a lot of data today, uh, we, and we have, uh, you know, we, we're doing this new Ayushman Bharat, 500 million people of India will, uh, it's a totally cashless portable digital scheme, or linking up 150,000 primary health centers with the district hospital, totally digital. So we'll have a huge amount of data, and uh, we look forward to partnering uh, with our new course as we go along. But the important thing is to put out a lot of this data uh, for many of our startups to work on and you know, wait for that. Excellent. So please join me in thanking both of them for this excellent conversation. Thank you. Just as a, just before they, just before they leave and as we take a...